thanks for having me, everybody. Um, as Max mentioned, um, I'm here to talk to you today about, uh, as the title of my lecture tonight says, uh, an alternate path. Um, and it's something that not a lot of people talk about in the design program, at least at Long Beach State. And it's, it's something that I maybe would have never heard about unless I actually got the position that I did. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight is um, kind of an overview of kind of my journey through the design world um, and then get into some details and specifics about kind of what my day-to-day -day roles and tasks are. So uh, let's get started. So Max called me up and said, hey, you wanna give a lecture about what you do? And um, I said, I thought about it for a minute and at first I was, you know, I don't know about this, but at the, sa at the same time, absolutely. Um, so yeah, absolutely, let's do this. And the reason behind that is um, I'm doing something that, uh, like Max mentioned, is a little bit different than the typical industrial design role. But the skill set that I've picked up with industrial design is, is so valuable to what I'm doing on a daily basis. So here's what we're gonna talk about tonight. I'll try to hopefully keep it really interesting and uh, very visual. Um, I'm gonna start out with kind of my path and my journey. Um, I've got a, a portion of this called the art of selling products. Um, and that is really what display is all about. Uh, I have a section called technology. And as you guys might've noticed, we had a little technical uh, problem up here, which as being somebody who is so connected to technology, I can't stand. But anyway, it happened and we're, we're going with it. Um, and then I've got concept to production. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through uh, a day in the life of what I do. Um, and then uh, a little portion at the end called visual storytelling. Uh, Max mentioned that I'm also a photographer. That's a, a part-time thing for me, but I've uh, actually built a photography business since I've graduated um, from Long Beach. So a little bit more detail about who I am. Um, as Max mentioned, class 2011, industrial design. Um, I am currently the creative director at Pacific Western Container, uh, running a division called Pacific Core. And what we do is we build displays and packaging for a huge variety of customers. And I'm gonna get into that uh, a little bit later in here, but. Basically my day to day is uh, leading a group of creatives that work in packaging and display. And then as I mentioned, I'm the principal photographer at Michael Porter Photography, which is again, a side, kind of a side business for me. So you hear it all the time when you get critiques, think outside the box. I kind of made a career out of it, uh, ironically. Um, and so what I kind of created here was um, my company that I work for again, Pacific Western, and I run a, a small division within that Pacific Core. And so we are the big creative, you know, we're the creative group. We're the ones that kind of make the pretty pictures, if you will. So a little bit more into who I am, and Max mentioned a few of these things, but um, kind of what, who I am and, and what makes me go around. Uh, first and foremost, um, family is super important to me. Um, my wife, who is sitting in the front row right here, kind of supporting me, is my biggest, my biggest supporter, my biggest cheerleader, and kind of drives me to, to do what I do on a, on a daily basis. Um, I've got a growing family coming as well, and that's what that top middle picture is. Um, I've got a baby on the way, and she's due in, uh, in January. Um, again, I'm a huge car lover, and BMWs are a passion of mine, and, and a I bring that up because it's something that is, it's important to me because it's built a, a big group of friends and it's built a network and a connection of people that have similar goals and similar drive in life. And what's important to me about that is that um, you're connecting to people on a much deeper level than maybe you would superficially um, just meeting somebody nonchalantly. So uh, forums have been a really big part of that and just getting to meet people. Um, the same thing in the mountain bike community. I've uh, been riding since I was a, you know, a young teenager and, and I've kept up with it just partially because I love building and the parts associated with it. And that's, I think, part of that whole industrial designer mindset. Um, but that's big to me. And then 
uh, again, uh, photography, um, addicted to cameras and probably have way too many, as my wife will attest. <laughs> um, and then uh, I'm a, a huge, like I said, mentioned before, a technology and, and audiovisual person. So when I have AV problems, it makes me crazy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with that, so where did, where did it all start? Well, I'd like to think that it started in elementary school with Legos. Um, and I'm sure some of you ID guys will uh, kind of agree with that, is that it's kind of that first time that we have free reign to create and design anything that, uh, anything that we want. And a, a story comes to mind in fourth grade. We did a project, and I can't remember the parameters of the project, but I had created a Lego crane. I, I don't know why, but we did, and presented it, and the, the teacher was like, this is great, Michael. It's really cool. It's very functional, but it's kind of ugly. And I was kind of taken back by that. What do you mean it's ugly? Well, did you think about the way that this thing looks? And it's the first time that anyone had ever said, did you think about aesthetics? Um, and again, very young age, but I remember it to this day. It hit home and I honestly, I probably never been the same ever since. Um, all my Legos were color coordinated after that in different bins and, and everything, but um, it just kind of made me into or jump-started this whole idea of design. So here's a little timeline of kind of my education and career path, and I think that's important because there is such a big crossover of my educational path as well as my career path, and part of this presentation today is gonna to talk about that, and I think that's so important because I got so much out of school at work, and I got so much at work from school and crossing those two together was very, very valuable. Um, and so uh, I, I started all the way back in junior high on this timeline. And the reason I did that is I was fortunate enough to go to a junior high school and a high school that offered design uh, classes. Everything from in junior high, mechanical drawing, some basic engineering where we were building bridges out of balsa wood and, and this weird glue. <laughs> and then uh, doing architectural design as, as an eighth grader. I mean, it's, it's kind of mind blowing now to think what we were doing, but learning to use a drafting board and a T-square and a triangle. But that sets a foundation for what we do in industrial design. And then in high school, that just kind of expanded from there. Um, we had classes in, again, mechanical drawing, where we learned, like the old guys did, on drafting tables and these big giant T-squares. And you tape pennies to your uh, triangle because you don't want smudges on your paper, you can't turn it in. I mean, it's just, it kind of, it just sets the, the groundwork. And then got introduced to AutoCAD. And as you all know, it's kind of a base software in the design world. Um, I don't use it anymore, but I use a software that is a derivative of that, and it's a, a 2D CAD software. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and that set a, a really good foundation um, for me going to Long Beach. And initially, I had this big passion of cars. And so Long Beach State had this automotive design program associated with it. And you guys might not have even heard of this because it was a while back. And, um, the semester I get to Long Beach, that program discontinued. So I say, all right, well, I want to design cars, and now this is all strictly product. Well, that's maybe not a bad thing. It really makes you a well-rounded designer. Let's embrace it and, and keep going. And I'm really glad that I did because it's led me to where I am today. And so uh, I also mentioned, so right after I started, one semester in, I get an opportunity to go to work for a company called Warehouser. Had no idea what it was, but I knew that it was, a, it was a job and it was in a creative field. And so I get this job at Warehouser and what I'm doing is I'm sweeping the floors and I'm cutting samples of packaging and displays and not really knowing everything that I'm really doing here, but um, it allowed me to get an intro into this stuff. And, very, very quickly they realized that, oh, this guy's going to design school, he's got some other skills. I was sitting in front of a computer learning their CAD software within three months and six months in I was already developing display solutions for major CPG companies. It, it went that quick. Um, shortly after, 
Weyerhaeuser, the division I was working for, was bought out by International Paper, and I worked for International Paper f up until last year, where I was presented an opportunity to take a position as a creative director, um, and I absolutely jumped at the uh, opportunity because I've, I feel like I'm a natural leader, and I really like to be the idea guy behind what we're doing, and so. Uh, last year, took that position and, and honestly could not be happier. Um, somewhere after school, I started developing a lot more of the photography skills and, and started and realizing that I needed to support this hobby that turned out to be very expensive. And my wife's chuckling because she's really glad that I did. <laughs> um, and that's been a, a really awesome ride as well. And so how did I take this automotive obsession as a kid and I've kind of turned it into a design career, not in automotive design. Um, well, like I said, I learned AutoCAD in high school. And um, in order to, to work on it at home, well, I wasn't going to go buy a version of AutoCAD. That's, at the time, very expensive software and, and really not something that was easy to get. So out with mom shopping. And we happen upon a, a software called IntelliCAD, and it's basically a direct copy of command line AutoCAD that I was learning at school. And so I sat every evening, you know, learning how to use this CAD software. Uh, along with my brother, we'd go find, you know, these these outline of cars, and we would just use the tools and draw and draw and draw in this 2D CAD software. And I mention that because when I got into um, doing CAD design in, in high school, or, and then also when I when I moved on to Long Beach, I tested out of CAD class. I, there was no reason to take the class. I had already mastered a lot of those those skills. In high school, I was an athlete, and I really design was not on my mind per se. It was a, it was a lot of fun, and honestly, I thought I was going to go into architecture and do more. Um, home design and, and that kind of thing because that's what we were learning in school. That's what our base knowledge of uh, drafting was in. But I was also playing sports. And why do I bring up playing sports? Well, later in life I realized how important sports was to the uh, work world, if you will. Um, and there's a few things that I've brought with me over the years that are just so uh, important to me and that a few of those are one teamwork right a lot of times and we learn this in in, in, uh, in school as well but you have to work with teams and you have to learn how to work with other people and other people's personalities and that becomes really really important when you get into a more of a management role or a leadership role within the design world because as we all know designers have a lot of personality and so understanding how to work as a team is is key um, a few other things. I mentioned leadership. Perseverance is really important, and, and perseverance is probably one of those things that uh, I took the most out of sports. Um, I went up to portfolio review the first year and didn't pass. Um, and that may have been the hardest thing up until that point that I've ever dealt with. And a lot of people quit after that. Um, but I've had similar struggles in, in sports and, and that in the past, and I realized, no, what that's telling me is that I need to work harder, buckle down, and go after it. And I'm glad that I did, because the next year passed, and by the time I was done in senior studio, I was you know, one of the, the top presenters and the people that was looked upon for advice and critique. And so uh, I'm really glad that at the time, I was not happy that that happened, but I'll tell you what, now looking back at it, it made me a better designer. So uh, just I'll show you a few things that I worked on in, in junior, junior and senior studio, just to kind of show you my background in ID. Um, alarm clock project, you guys do this, I think you still do this project, but take an everyday product for an unsuspecting brand. Uh, that's one of those, one of those projects. Um, this one, was a sponsored project for Western Digital. And I, I specifically bring this one up because while I was working on this project in Junior Studio for Western Digital, at International Paper, I was also working on projects for Western Digital. And so I was doing the actual product development in 
studio and I was doing the packaging and display work for Western Digital at work. So it was a pretty cool experience and time. Um, and then by senior studio, I had to go back to cars. So that is my senior thesis project, if you will. Um, and it is, of course, developed from uh, uh, BMW. And so um, maybe a little ambitious. A lot of people don't uh, try to model cars in SolidWorks, but uh, I was determined to do so. And uh, I'm pretty proud of it. I think it came out um, pretty cool. It's something that I, I still have the big four foot by eight foot board hanging in my garage and all my neighbors think it's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, so I mentioned that I've been, I was working on Western Digital projects at the same time I was doing it at school. And so I was working full time and going to school. And what you learn really, really quickly is time management. And I stress this to my design team right now uh, that I currently work with. And, and time management is something that is so important and so crucial to the professional world. Um, I think that it's often um, underappreciated, but finish projects, get them done, figure out what you can get done in a timeline, and accept and be happy with what you've done. There's always the next project, but go in, sell it, own it, and, and actually turn something in. Because when your management team comes to you and say, I need a presentation done in this amount of time, that's it. That's all the time you've got and they've got to show something. So manage your time really well. Um, I won't harp on it too much, but you can tell I'm pretty passionate about time management. <laughs> okay, so let's get into like kind of the, the nitty gritty of what I do. Um, and I've got, I got two things I'm gonna say. I've got one that's like kind of the technical definition and I've got one that's more of the funny short definition. So let me start with the technical one and bore you to death and then I'll give you the funny one where you can chuckle at. Um, so the technical one is that as a display designer, we develop temporary, semi-permanent, and permanent visual merchandising solutions to increase brand awareness and influence consumer purchase patterns. Yeah, it's a lot of words, right? But it sounds really good when you're selling to big CPGs. Uh, the reality is, it is we make cardboard look pretty to help sell products. <laughs> Um, it's, it's what we do. We put color on paper and we load a bunch of products on it and try to sell them. Um, I find it to be a very, very rewarding business. And the reason I find it so rewarding is that we're constantly working on new projects. Uh, the turnaround time for display and packaging is substantially shorter than it is on a typical product development um, job. Right, so we could actually go from concept napkin sketch to production CAD files in less than eight hours. I mean, it's, it's that quick at times. There's other times where we've worked on projects for three years. It, it really is um, very, very complex and diverse in the nature of, of projects that we're working on. So my first section, if you will, is kind of what I call the art of selling products. And um, it is the, the basis of, of POP. And why do I call it art? Well, I call it art because it takes this really vast and expansive knowledge of the industry to get really good at it. Um, and I, I don't want to sound um, conceited about that, but the reality is, is that experience helps a lot in this business. Um, and the more time you can put into it and the more you can soak up and, and take in with this business, it, it just helps. Um, and the, the other reason that I call it the art of selling products is because it's the first interaction that a person has with a product. And I think that's so important to let fellow designers know, especially industrial designers, but this has the same thing for uh, interior and, and architectural design as well as general design. Packaging and display is that first thing that you notice. And I'll start, you, you have a, a higher level where you're in a retail store and that display is that first thing that you see uh, of that product. And then on a little closer level, you have the packaging, right? And that is 
that packaging becomes really, really uh, important because we all say, you know, you shouldn't judge a book by a cover, by its cover. The reality is, is that in the POP world, you're always judging the product by the cover. And so let's talk about iconic packaging design. And I bring that, I, I actually rendered this image because I couldn't find a good enough picture of it. But uh, in 2004, I remember getting this iPod as a gift. Um, and I still remember it to this day. It made an impact on me. But why did it make an impact on me? Well, one, um, I just think that the designers behind it cared. Uh, they realized that packaging was much more important than just a vehicle for the product that was inside. It was just, it was a part of the product. And so this, this package had a sleeve that slid out and the actual inside box opened like a book. And then each one of those halves opened like a book, but it was an experience. And experiences in packaging have become so much bigger than they were even, let's say 10 years ago. There's been this emergence of unboxing videos on YouTube. Well, why are there unboxing videos on YouTube? Who cares what the packaging looks like? Well, if nobody cared, there wouldn't be unboxing videos, right? And so people notice when packaging is really, really cool, but they also notice when packaging sucks, okay? And I say that bluntly because there is some packaging that is just terrible. You have extremely high-end products in a package that says, I'm cheap. And so there's a fine line in understanding where to spend your budget or your marketing budget on packaging uh, or display because you're trying to, honestly, you're trying to sell your product based on what it looks like. Um, otherwise, what are people looking at in the store, right? They need to see what it is, they need features and benefits, um, and they need to know why your product is better than the one sitting next to it. But in order for them to even pick up that box on the package, it has to be visually enticing. And so we have this, I mentioned it a few times now, but what is POP or point of purchase? And um, again, with the, the definitions, I try not to put any words on this presentation. I want you guys to just look at visuals and kind of listen to what um, you know, we're talking about tonight. But uh, so the actual point of purchase is the place or moment that a consumer makes a buying decision. And the action can take place in a physical retail environment like a, a store or in a digital marketplace like Amazon, right? The purpose of displays and packaging is one, you're increasing brand awareness for people that may not understand or know what that brand is, um, or you're expanding product uh, awareness. And so you, what you're trying to do in the grand scheme of things is you're trying to initiate that purchase. And that is what our sole job is as display and packaging designers is helping to initiate a purchase. Because in the grand scheme of things, all we're trying to do is sell a bunch of product. All right. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, on this slide. And the reason behind that is that what we do on a daily basis um, is a lot. Um, and it's a really well-rounded um, field. So I feel like you take this really well-rounded design knowledge or background that you get at a place like Long Beach and uh, you can turn it into this very alternate career that we're talking about tonight. So uh, a little bit of background on kind of the path or the way that we go through um, projects and the um, kind of roles that take place while doing so. So the first thing is concept development. We all know what that is. We're ideating, right? We're, we're coming up with concepts. We're sketching things out. It, it may even be a quick rendering um, and, and kind of anything in between, but we're selling an idea. Once we've sold that idea in packaging display, we kind of break up design into structural design and graphic design. The reality is, is that the best des designers in the field know both. Um, so structural design is more of the engineering. It's the, how do you take something in 3D? So let's say this box right here, and I see this box, okay? 
how do I take that and visualize it in a 2D form that can be manufactured and then rebuilt into this 3D piece? That's what structural design does in, in a very simple uh, way. In graphic design, I hate to say that it's, it's graphics, but really it's, it's a creative department that deals in a lot of different things. One, um, they do renderings just like structural design will do renderings. They just may put more color on it, right? They'll do final art, which means we're making production ready files that go out to our printers. So they need to understand printing processes and color theory and understanding traps and bleeds and, and all this stuff that becomes really important when you're building production ready files. Uh, next to that, I have consumer trends on here. And we talk a lot about that in product, product design. And I think you talk about it a lot in, in uh, wayfinding and, and uh, architectural design as well. Who's your buyer? Without knowing who your buyer is, how do you appeal to them? And so digging into consumer trends and customer insights and retailer insights becomes a really big part of what we do on a daily basis. We're not just cutting out pieces of corrugated and putting them together. There's a lot more involved and there's a lot more behind the scenes that I don't think maybe a lot of people kind of understand or have seen in the past, um, but we dig in deep to kind of what makes people tick and why they would be buying a certain product. Some projects we, we dig in a little bit deeper than others. Some are just very, very simple projects and you don't even need to really know that. Um, looks like we're virus scanning here. That's okay. All right, the next thing, uh, sales. Now, we're not directly in sales. There's account managers for that. But as designers, we're taught very, very early on how to sell. You may not think about it as selling, but anytime you give a presentation on your product or your design or your whatever you're working on, you're selling it and you're selling yourself. And so as a designer, we're constantly selling ourselves. And I think that's, I really think it's important to kind of understand that you are in sales, even though you may not be in a direct role. Uh, because I'll be honest with you, the best salespeople of display and packaging are the people that design it because they're intimate with it and they know what they're looking at and they know what they're talking about and there's always reasons behind what they did. I will give a piece of advice on the sales side. Don't let it get personal. As designers, we have a lot of personality and we let things get to us when a lot of times we're presenting a display and they just take it and kind of toss it away and you just put three days worth of work into that design. It can hurt. It's hurting before. <laughs> um, I can't say that it's, you know, it's not a good feeling, but in the grand scheme of things, um, it only makes you better. And the best thing about displaying packaging is just, pa just hide that away. And then when there's another customer that's in a similar field, you just take that back out, slop the graphics on it again and represent it. And that customer may love it. So uh, you never have to worry about throwing it away, per se. We, we like to recycle uh, a lot. Um, workflow management. Now, one of the reasons I was brought in to my current position um, was because of my background in workflow management. And it's not something that I was, perf it was not something that I was technically trained in, but it was something that I developed over the years of working um, in, the, in, this, in this field. And what I mean by workflow management is, is two things. It could be the physical workflow of actually building, creating, um, shaping. There's that side of it, and there's also the digital workflow. How do you best use your tools that you're given to do your work? And uh, this is something that I stress a lot about now because we're always talking about efficiencies, and we need to make sure that... Um, everyone's working efficiently. And that's not, that's not something to say that we're trying to get people to do more work in a day, because I don't think that's fair to say, but what I like to say about that is, I want people to work smarter, not harder. So if there's a quicker, easier way to do something, let's find out what that is and implement it. And that could be as simple as, um, about a year before I left International Paper, we moved offices and but prior to moving offices, we needed to redesign the space because really it was this big blank canvas of a room and we needed to figure out how we were going to lay this all out. So I sat down with a few other folks and really I, was, I took lead on this. And 
I didn't necessarily have a background in space planning or, or that, but I knew enough about how we interacted with all of our tools on a daily basis to understand how to make things work. And the, the best way I can describe it is when you're, when you're designing a kitchen, you have this triangle of efficiency where you have your refrigerator, your sink, and your stove. And everything should be in this perfect triangle. Well, you can apply the same thing to your tools in display and packaging design. You have your big die cutter, and you have a printer, and you have a work table, and you have all your clips and hooks and all your tricks. Well, all of that stuff needs to just be right here right? Because it just makes it more efficient. You shouldn't be running on one side of the room to get one thing and then back to the other side and then back again. Yeah, it's a lot slower, but it's for no reason. There's, there's no reason behind it. So workflow, I think, is really, really important. Next thing I've got is logistics. I never thought I'd be learning about logistics, working in display and packaging, but the reality is it's become a bigger part of everyday design than I ever imagined it would. And it's a, we deal with things like actual trucking and testing. There's a, there's a testing group called, uh, it's a, a type of test called an ISTA test. It's an, um, we have to actually get displays and packaging to sustain damage from these tests. They'll take a box like this and literally drop it from four feet in the air onto eight different sides, flat sides, corners, and everything. And there's a, a minimum, or there's a maximum amount of damage that is allowable uh, in order for it to pass that test. And sometimes we don't get a job because it doesn't pass a test. So it can actually be kind of grueling uh, in understanding logistics. And the other side is back on the sales side, it ties right back into logistics. And the reason behind that is when we're designing display, we may be more expensive on the actual display side, but we figured out a way to package it a lot smaller and more efficiently on pallets in trucks. And so we've now saved an exorbitant amount of money on trucking, even though the companies may be paying a little bit more um, on the packaging. And so it's key to understand the entire process throughout design, manufacturing, and logistics. So that's a perfect leeway into printing and manufacturing. We're just as much high-end printers as we are designers and, and um, kind of creatives. And so we need to understand what's going on in the printing world. So the difference between flexographic and lithographic printing, you know, one of them is a giant four color press, very high-end uh, photorealistic printing. The other is a giant rubber stamp that has a, you know, a max of like four colors. And so there's a difference, but do you serve the, do you, do you have a cost and a price point that you're trying to hit? Or are you trying to do really high end graphics and, and uh, put, you know, display renderings or photo images or lifestyle images? You determine that. And then also understanding printing processes, you can help sell based on your knowledge of what things cost. And so it's all this, this big intertwined game. And so I kind of mentioned space planning or space planning in, in workflow. Uh, I won't touch on it again because we kind of looked at, uh, I kind of explained what I meant there. And then technology, I've got a whole nother section that I'd like to discuss technology with you guys because again, it's one of those things that I'm super passionate about, but it actually has a, plays a huge role in what I do every day. All right, we'll get past that screen now. You don't have to look at that one anymore. But I'll give you some examples of kind of what, uh, what we create on a daily basis. Um, and so here's uh, examples of counter displays. Um, counter displays are used a lot of times for impulse buys. And so when you're standing in line at Target or Walmart and you're looking at the gum and you're like, oh, that looks really good or I need a candy bar, there's also displays right by that. And so you're trying to sell product. And so you create these small counter display units that have usually inexpensive product and you're just trying to move you're trying to move product get people to buy something that they wouldn't necessarily think about on the other hand we have floor displays uh, these are two examples for Avery Denison that were for office products so these would be found in a, like a Staples or an Office Depot something like that and all you're trying to do here um, is you're making visual impact and you're trying to get quick movement of a bunch of product in a small amount of space. So typically these displays will be in like a, a two foot by two foot section. 
And that can be difficult because now you're limited in, in basically you have a pillar of space to work with and you're trying to come up with the best way to, to market products. And so like, for example, this display on the right, that actually has actual product labels mounted to fake product on this side graphic panel. But it allowed people to see, touch, feel, see how actual print was gonna work on those actual products. Then we have display families. And I put this one together because I wanted to show you, this was all for a product launch for Dr. Pepper for their Pick Your Pepper campaign. Pick Your Pepper was basically um, kind of a copy of uh, Share Coke. Uh, and so uh, Share Coke had names, Pick Your Pepper had vintage labels, um, but it was all about picking your favorite vintage label. But the reason I show this one is because you have three different styles of displays here, all meeting different price points, all going into different retailers. And how do you know these things? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of background into knowing what works for different retailers. And I actually will kind of go through that as well. Uh, but this is just showing you that sometimes you'll take the same brand of product or even the same exact product and you'll develop all these different solutions that meet a lot of different criteria. Then we have this one. When you walk into the front of the store, we, in, in the industry, we kind of call it the spectacular. Um, as corny as that sounds, but all you're trying to do is make an impact. Uh, and I, I brought this one up and actually the next one that I'm gonna show uh, because these are actually uh, 2017 uh, DOT award finalists uh, that I worked on. Um, and so DOT is Design of the Times. It's a packaging and display trade journal that then also has a lack of better word governing body to it that um, you have to pay to submit your, your pieces of work, but it gets you a lot of recognition in the industry. And when you're working on major players like Dr. Prep or Snapple Group, um, it's key to get things noticed and out there um, that you're working on such big brands. Um, and so this one, again, this is another finalist too. Um, and this one was, uh, I have an interesting story about this one. Um, it may seem kind of simple uh, to the eye, but there's actually a lot going on. And there was a lot of work that went in on the front end that we as designers kind of learn how to do, uh, especially in the ID program. And I remember um, I took something that I, I learned from my final project, uh, the, the BMW like retro car design. We had to create a video for that project. And part of that video, I figured out a way to create all these slides that mesh together with transitions and lights and um, it made it look like the angel eyes were coming on on the headlights and then the headlights were kind of slowly coming on and, and lighting up. Well, I remembered that project when we were talking about this one because this project, we wanted to incorporate light and sound. That's pretty sweet. We get to, ins we get to put electronics into paper. <laughs> I mean, that's not something that we necessarily think about. Well, the entire backside of the big orange uh, crush circle was foil laminated on the backside and we installed these really bright LEDs behind it along with a motion sensor and sound box. So when you had a customer walk by this thing, it not only was visually appealing, it, uh, it went to a few other senses, right? And so this thing lit off lightning and cracked thunder and said, oh, I'm spooky because it's <laughs> Halloween, right? Um, and, and so we took that and we actually created a video that showed that and we won the business because of that video. Uh, so something I picked up while I was, while working in school, picked up how to do that, served me well um, in the real world. And then kind of a, a cool thing that plays into that ID mindset is that these are all major player companies, major CPG companies um, that I've worked with over the past 12 years of uh, my display and packaging career. And what I love about that is that I love new products coming out. And by getting to work with some of these major brands, I get to see products that are going out to market long before the general public does because we're working on packaging display for them. And we have to launch those products along with that packaging. And so seeing pre-released you know, Beats and Skull Candy headphones or what the next big thing that Seagate is gonna come out with, uh, hard drive technology, or what is Nike Golf up to next? Because I'm, I'm a big golfer as well. 
So it just kind of feeds into your, uh, into your passions and, and into your, your interests. And so I, I got to say, it's been really cool to be able to work with some of these, these brands. So you noticed I actually worked with a lot of technology brands um, on that last page. And technology is one of those things that's kind of important to me. And my wife will call me a, a tech nerd. Um, I'll accept it, I guess. I do get called by all the family to fix everybody's problems, but I uh, couldn't fix my own here tonight <laughs> without another computer. Um, but technology plays a really, really big part in our everyday uh, design world, especially in, in packaging. You're like, don't you just deal in paper? Yeah, we do, right? We, we transform technically paper into these major 3D objects, but behind it, is a boatload of technology. Starting with our software, and you'll notice, I'm sure everyone recognizes the two pieces of software on the right, but I can almost, maybe let me see if anybody knows the two on the left. Is anyone familiar? I've got one hand in the back, which is pretty awesome. Um, and so ESCO software, it's the number one packaging and display software in the world. Um, and it's called RDOs CAD. Why I bring up RDOs CAD? Well, RDOs CAD is a 2D design software that is rec not recently, but they also have a 3D um, component. And then the pink icon is another ESCO software that interacts directly with Adobe Illustrator and creates a rendering engine within Adobe Illustrator. And I, I would explain in more detail, but it's kind of mind boggling the way that all of this kind of works together and functions, but it makes my life so much easier. The other reason why I wanted to bring up software is because whatever software you guys are working in, um, in your, your careers or in school, get to know the inner workings of them. Go dive into the preferences. Go figure out how to fix things. Go make custom parts. Um, change your toolbars. Make hotkeys. Uh, I learned hotkeys learning the software. And instead of clicking icons, I use my keys. But that has enabled me to become so much faster in everyday tasks than someone that just uses uh, icons. That seems trivial, maybe. But the reality is, is that that is one of the questions that I ask to potential candidates uh, that I'm looking for to, to work in packaging display. Do you use hotkeys? Like, how well do you know the inner workings of the software? Because to me, a troubleshooter and someone that's willing to go into the inner workings of a software is someone that's going to dive in and take chances in their work as well. And a lot of times that's going to pay off. Another thing I wanted to bring up here, and this is just a, a, another short thing, but I recently spent three weeks with some high-level folks at, at ESCO Software installing some major software for my company. And... By the end of that three weeks, I was offered to uh, come out to the RDOs CAD users group and then give an entire workflow demo on start to finish within the packaging display software. Um, and that included everything from the initial structural design all the way through graphic design and into final production renderings. So I mention that because I challenge everyone here to become experts in their software. Now, Photoshop and Illustrator, I know the tools that I need to use. I'm not by any means telling you I'm a Photoshop or Illustrator expert because I'm not. I don't know half of the software, but I'm an expert in the tools that I use on a daily basis with them. And so constantly expanding that knowledge and constantly learning, um, I challenge everyone, everyone to do. Another thing that we pick up, and this is something that uh, will help everybody in the, des in the design world, is understanding spot colors and what's talked about in the display world, specifically the Pantone matching system. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this before. There's color libraries within Illustrator and Photoshop that you can pick all these colors. But we use them because it's a way for our customers to dictate um, their colors and for us to match them in production in a solid way to do it. Because we all know that most of the time, we're clicking, <laughs> uh, most of the time we don't have calibrated monitors. And that's another thing I challenge everyone to do. Get a calibrated monitor. Calibrate your monitor, get good colors. Um, it's very, very 
it's a it's a big deal when you're dealing with printing and, and high-end graphics and so Pantone kind of um, makes it a little bit easier to match everything and then down at the bottom the display and packaging world is just this crazy world of acronyms and so um, you'll hear things like this one down here 4CP plus 2PMS plus AQ well to anyone not in the industry, they're like, I have no idea what that means. But basically, it's we're printing it four color process, so CMYK. We've got two spot colors included, so maybe that's a customer's two color logo, for example. And then AQ is an aqueous coating. So I won't get, you know, dig in too much into the technical side of that, but just know we're littered with uh, all these different acronyms and you end up learning all. It's like you speak a different language. Um, and a funny story behind that is in the business we call a bill of materials. Everyone just shortens it to BOM and everyone calls it a bomb. Well, far too often you are walking through an airport on your phone and you're like, where's the bomb? I've been waiting for it all day. Um, I don't recommend that. It's happened to a few of our sales folks and they get really, really bad looks. Um, and all they're talking about is the bill of materials. So um, I got to say the acronyms can be really, really funny. Um, when I started in this business, that was the machine I learned to use first. Uh, it is a Kongsberg cutting table. And what that does is it takes that die line over on the left of the screen. We cut it out on a sheet of corrugated and we fold it up and it turns into something 3D. So the gist of what I do is I see things in 3D. I, in, I unfold them in my head and figure out how to build them flat with cuts and creases and partial cuts and perfs and all these different types of rule that we call. And we send it to a CAD table and then we build it. I mean, it's as simple as, as that. Now, it can be a lot more complicated and we have a library of standards that we can base on so that we're not starting from the, starting from scratch always, but, um, the gist of that is that we, yeah, we basically just take something that we're looking at and it could be anything, a display. A lot of times I'm actually building product in the same kind of tools and figuring out how to build them. Oh, let's see. All right. So now's a little show and tell. <laughs> um, we did a project for Beats headphones. I, sh I showed you we work with Beats in the past and so uh, we were asked to develop just a promotional piece uh, that was going to go to the executives at Beats and it needed to be fun and exciting and uh, kind of ridiculous at the same time, but it needed to spark interest and initiate communication. Um, and so we developed the guy that kind of looks like Dr. Dre on the left and then we did this fun one for ourselves in the office um, on the right. But So I brought, I brought him in today because it's not only just a um, little corrugated guy. Um, it actually is a fully functional iPod or phone speaker and it has a built-in high-res or hi-fi hi amplifier built right into the head. And uh, see if I can pull up Pandora here and show you guys how this works. One second here. So it's a fully functional speaker that you can plug into your buds, but it's built out of nothing but paper. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty slick. So the, the kind of cool thing about that is that I got to take my passion of AV and, and home theater, um, take my knowledge of building speakers, which I actually built a set of speakers in shop class in, as part of Long Beach and put that all together with my packaging and display background and build something that I've now had on my desk for a few years and it gets a ton of looks and a ton of people talking about it. And sometimes that's all it takes. Um, we do a lot of, I, I kind of challenge all my designers to do personal projects as well. Um, it's not always about what the customer wants. Sometimes it's about creating your own um, pieces, right? And that's kind of the idea behind the one on the right. But it gets people talking. In my last office, 
we had a full-size R2-D2 built completely out of corrugated. We had a AT-AT the size of a Great Dane. Um, we were Star Wars freaks. We loved it. We, we built a pterodactyl skeleton that hung from the ceiling that had a nine-foot wingspan. I'm telling you, these things had nothing to do with any customer's request, but every customer that walked in absolutely loved this stuff and realized that these guys have creativity and these are the guys we want to work with. And so challenging yourself to do these personal projects is, is really, really big. Okay. And then we take all those things that we've, we've put together, the technology, the paper, the, the different material studies, and you understand all, how all these things go together, and then you build things like what you see here. And may not be a lot, you may not be able to tell uh, from a few things, but the, the pink display actually has a looping um, uh, TV screen on it with audio that played a short little video, and I heard that video so many times that I think it was ingrained in our brain for a good year after this project. We heard it so many times. Uh, but that had a motion sensor and it had batteries and we had to figure out what length of clip we could use and what size screen was the most efficient for battery usage because we needed it to last a certain amount of time. Um, and it just became, it's a way bigger challenge than you might imagine. And then on this one, we actually had um, machined out edge-lit acrylic that was then polished. And so it, sh it, sh it didn't even need a light source. It shined so well in the retail environment. And up at the top, the two little guys um, kind of sitting at an angle, those were on motion-activated spinners. And so we're just trying to, we're trying to grab people's attention. That's really what we're trying to do with both the structure and the graphics. And to me, I, was a, I started as a structural designer. And so my job was to create the the bones behind the graphics, right? Now, I wasn't ever happy enough just making things square and rectangular. I always wanted to push the envelope to what was possible in, in this stuff. And so working directly with our concept artists, we would create all these um, crazy ideas and concepts. And when a lot of times when we were being introduced to customers coming around, they'd be like, well, this is the engineer and this is the graph and or the, this is the concept designer and this is the engineer. And I cringed every time because as ID guys, we are we're we're behind the concept, right? And I I'm not an engineer. <laughs> we're more creative than that. Um, all right, we're going to jump into a little bit of concept of production. I hope I'm not boring anybody, but I just want to give you guys kind of a real broad overview of a, a day in the life, if you will. And so the process, how do we get from that concept through production? I've simplified this unbelievably uh, so, but basically we get a request that can come from anybody uh, in the marketing team or, you know, somebody in the design side of a CPG company, um, they'll often talk directly to our account managers. We get told in design that here we've got a new project and you're going to work on it and here's what you got to, here's your parameters of your project. Okay, cool. So we design, we try to get it approved. If it's not approved, we go back to design and so on and so forth until we get it approved and then we move on. So I mentioned before that we have production. Well, Production, it, we're, we're doing a lot of things, right? We're putting all these pieces of the puzzle together with a bunch of different manufacturing processes and we're trying to make it all match and put it all together in a timely fashion and then ship it out, which is that whole logistics section that I was talking about. One of the first things that we need to understand um, are the retailer guidelines. And I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with what's on the top right here, but that is a, a Walmart retailer in-store display guide. And I think Walmart's is upwards of, I think back to college is like 80 pages and the regular one is, I don't know, 150 plus pages. And basically you're like handed these every, <laughs> every time there's a, a new promotion or a new year or a new holiday or a new special event, you get a new guideline and those guidelines change every time so we're constantly having to study these guidelines and we're really expected to know them kind of not the itty gritty details but the general idea um like instantly you know customers are asking us well was walmart going to accept that uh no they're not going to accept that but they will accept this and so you really got to think on the fly and be um 
you got to be that that subject matter expert. Um, and so this is an example. So back to college said all the displays need to be gray. It needs to have this logo in the center of the tray. This was a, a preliminary concept, so we weren't giving keyboards away for free, but we didn't know the price. And then it has to have a very specific font size and style over on the other side. Uh, it, it really digs down in, into that deep as far as um, what Walmart will accept, not accept. Uh, and they do it for in-store uniformity, right? So um, when you're walking down an aisle, especially at back to school time, all the trays are yellow. Now, a lot of people have trouble matching colors, so they're not as consistent as you'd like them to be. Uh, but generally speaking, the entire aisle looks like a blown up pencil, you know, number two pencil. The other thing we need to know is what's the, what is the customer trying to do? In this case, it's a call to action, right? There is no product being displayed on that display, okay? Uh, that is simply having the customer do something. Now, that doesn't always work with a new product launch or a new uh, business, right? But when you're talking about somebody as established as a 7-Up or a Coca-Cola or a Nike or a Sony or one of those major brands, they can do things like this because brand recognition is already there, but they're having, it's a special purpose. They're telling these people to, they were talking about the Latin Grammys in this one, so hence the escucha up, but um, this was simply telling them to go do something, okay? Um, at the same time, maybe we need uh, some consumer engagement. And so uh, we deal with this a lot, uh, dealing with um, major companies like, like a Dr. Pepper or a Coca-Cola. What they're trying to do is they're trying to maximize their ROI, their return on investment. They need to make sure that what they're spending is being returned in sales. And in this case, uh, this was a four-pack bottle carrier for Super Bowl. And so team of designers, right, we got together and we said, okay, they want a drink carrier, but they don't want it to be a throwaway item. Because a lot of times you go into um, even a fast food restaurant and they have that corrugated drink carrier, but what do you do? You take your drinks to wherever you're going, you take them out, you toss it, that's it, right? So that is a 100% throwaway item, which what that means to you is the price of that just got added to your soft drink. In this case, they didn't want to add uh, a ton of cost, but if they did, they wanted to make sure that the, the person buying that beverage got something else out of it. So in this case, uh, on the left, they had the you know scoring, like betting scorecard, and then you could pop out the football, put it together, and it became like the, the team trophy, if you will, for whoever won the bet. And then on the, the right, we were saying, okay, it, at the time, uh, hashtagging on Instagram was still big, but hashtagging on Instagram and um, trying to build a brand and connect with people that way was big. So what did we do? We made a, a helmet-ish um, uh, that could rip out the bottom of this thing and you could hold it up behind the helmet and you could take the picture and then you would hashtag DPSG for Dr. Pepper Snapple Group and then you would be entered to win some contest. And so what it's doing is it's, it's making sure that people are interacting with the product and making something memorable. So the next time they're at retail, they're not thinking Coca-Cola, they're thinking Dr. Pepper. This looks incredibly simple and kind of boring. And I get that it, at times, was really, really boring. But simplicity can fool you in the display world. That was a three year development project for uh, Paramount Farms, which is the uh, big conglomerate behind Wonderful Pistachios and Palm Wonderful, the, the pomegranate company. And so literally we worked on this project for, th for three years, developing a solution to replace this wood crated bin that's at every retailer that you can imagine. They're in Walmart, they're in you know, Target, they're in grocery. I mean, they're, they're literally everywhere. And the number of bins that they run is breathtaking. Like, there's no other way to describe it. When you hear the quantities that they're producing of that bin, it's, it's astronomical, it's mind-blowing. Um, and so it makes sense for a big company at the time, International Paper, to go after uh, 
a brand like this and put a bunch of resources and time and development into it. And so we looked at everything. We, we did so much ideation for this, this project. It was numbing. Um, we did a ton of testing. We sold it like you couldn't believe. We traveled a ton. I, I can't count the number of times that I made the drive over the grapevine to go up to, to Del Rey uh, and Lost Hills up in Central California to go look at um, their facilities. And so that's another really cool thing that I never thought I would be doing, but I got to go into and see how food was prepared, well, pistachios, how they were pulled off the tree, how they were processed and cooked and, and roasted and salted and then bagged and boxed. And, and I mean, seeing that entire process, we spent a whole day there. Never thought I'd be doing that. It's, it's crazy, but it's really, really cool to go and see that on the, the same side on the pomegranates. And we got into such detail with this thing that we, we were trying to pull every last cost out of this. Um, but still make it as strong as possible. So we were evalu evaluating the type of material, the coating on the material, this, even the staples that were going to go into the wood pallet this thing is sitting on, and then the amount of product that it was. And so I bring this one up because sometimes the simplest of, of products are the most difficult to design. Um, I think that that, that goes to... Uh, product when you're de designing a new uh, mobile device, a, a cell phone, for example. It's the tiniest little details that make the biggest difference. The same thing when you're developing a, uh, a floor plan, right? Uh, you're walking through a space. Just a few extra inches here or there can make a world of difference in the way that a space feels when you walk into it. It's the same thing in display and packaging. The, the littlest details matter, and that's what that project really taught, taught me. CPG companies love things that are modular. Um, and you kind of get bored of it after a while, and you hope that the first one was really, really well done because then when they want to reorder it a thousand times um, and you keep seeing the same tiny little mistake that you may have made, it really frustrates the heck out of you. <laughs> um, but at the same time, our businesses love it because we don't have to buy tooling over and over and over again. And tooling is one of those things that customers hate having to pay for. They just hate it. They're like, can't you just make it? I don't want to pay for the tooling behind it. But you can't injection mold a part without a tool. You can't build a corrugated display without a die board. It's the same thing, or print plates. Um, so what do we try to do? We try to maximize ROI again by one, either just changing graphics, which is what you see on the left, or two, we took two of these, we made them back to back, we did reversible artwork on both sides so that you could put them back to back, and then we built this header topper um, that turned it into a totally different looking display, but the bones of it were all the same display that we have been running for program after program after program. So think modular. It's the same thing in, in product design. How do you use the same kind of parts over and over again. Uh, Ford is a big example of doing that. If you look at you know, a Ford Escape versus a Ford Taurus versus a Ford Fiesta, more than likely they're gonna, you're gonna find similarities in parts that are used, whether it be as simple as a radio knob or a window switch or a shift knob, right? But modularity becomes important in any aspect of design. And we take it even a step further where we take and we do these graphic additions. And again, we offer that for that whole idea of, of ROI. Some programs, uh, MOTS, for example, may have a bigger profit margin than A&W Root Beer does. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but let's just use it as an example. Um, so with MOTS, we can get, you know, uh, a two-sided header that goes down the middle and, and we can do all these big fancy graphics and, and make it really, really cool looking or, or A&W. You know what? Maybe we did have the same budget. So we created this, we made it look like an overflowing mug. But with Crush and Sierra Mist over there, uh, we had really no budget. So we had to kill the header and we had to do a much simpler graphic. It's all about figuring out and working with your customers and, and understanding their needs what the target market is, understanding those customer insights and what draws them to a particular product, and 
really understanding how to sell that product. So I bring this one up because I developed this style of display, I can't even remember how many years ago, but basically we were challenged to do something different. This company was sick of seeing straight lines and square boxes and they wanted something new. Um, this is concept artwork for Hurley that is not has, has nothing to do with the actual uh, uh, customer that we were working with, but I wanted to make it visual. Uh, but they wanted something different. And so, you know, at the time, I think I was doing a uh, form study uh, in school. And so everything was curves and there weren't any straight lines. Well, how do we take something that's typically all straight lines and add scores and make it curved and make it appear uh, something that no one's ever seen before? Well, I just started playing and I built all these little half scale about the size of this guy um, and just started testing how the material worked. And what ends up happening is if you guys have seen these, these boxes that are these little tiny boxes that kind of pop open and you, you have these curved side panels for like gift cards. I kind of thought of it on the same lines as that and went full scale with it. And what's cool about this thing is it has a score right down the center and you take it and you can literally just push in on the center and the thing snaps into place, just pop. And you set it down, it's done. I mean, it's, it's super simple and we built all these different versions of them. Some had multiple scores in them. And we had like five of these different displays and they were just white and ugly, but every single customer that walked into our office and came for a tour and wanted to talk about display solutions and packaging gravitated towards that display. And like, tell me more. That gets people sold. It, we might not do curved scores at all, on their displays. But again, they saw that innovation, they saw the um, excitement behind what we were doing as designers, and they saw that we had some creativity. We sold ourselves. And then I had to bring it back to cars. <laughs> so, first thing I wanna say about this is everything you see in this picture, except for the actual rubber on the tires is built out of uh, corrugated or paper. The entire thing, even the chassis of this car is built out of what we call fiber tubes, um, just basically layered poles that are made out of paper. Um, we were asked by Nintendo to create something to sell ourselves. So we kind of went all out. Uh, our account manager said, do you think you can build a Mario Kart, full or like full size Mario Kart? Yeah, I can do that. Let's, let's work on that. So a month later, we did a bunch of, you know, we had prototypes and samples, and finally we did one in color, and um, it just absolutely, like, uh, Nintendo was blown away. They asked for it to be hand-delivered to their corporate headquarters for their lobby, um, and it was one of those projects that I absolutely love to show because it was so much fun, and it, we got to do something that was just so much different. That doesn't have any product on it. But people know Nintendo, they know Super Mario, and they know Mario Kart. And when they see this thing, it instantly makes them like, first of all, I can't tell you how many people wanted to go sit in it. <laughs> um, not quite that strong, but um, surprisingly held together really, really well. And I just, I love, sh I love showing it off. <laughs> and uh, all right, last portion of, uh, my, my talk tonight is a little bit about my kind of personal business, and that is um, my photography business. And I, I like to call it visual storytelling, and that's because I think of my background in design and the way that we tell stories through our product presentations. We start with everything from who is the person that's buying this product? Why would they want to be buying this product? And then what is the product and why is it cool? Well, you do the same thing when you're, when you're taking photos of people. And so um, there's a quote that a guy named Jim Gennard said, and I think you guys may be familiar with his name. He's a guy that founded Oakley and more recently read Digital Cinema. Um, and I follow him regularly on what's, what he's doing and, and what that company's up to. But uh, I'd like to read it to you guys. The, the camera is arguably one of the most important of all inventions. It's the single tool that has the ability to stop time, record history, generate art, tell stories, 
and communicate messages that transcend language like nothing else ever conceived. That hit, that kind of hit home to me because it, it is one of those, one of those things where a photograph can, can do a lot. Uh, it can tell a story. It can, it can cause emotion. Um, it can be a memory trigger. Um, and honestly, uh, a little bit with that, you know, you can kind of relate that to a, a special product. Maybe it's something you remember as a kid, um, or maybe it's something you saw in a store. Um, but a, a photograph is, is super powerful. And ever since school, I picked up a camera um, early on, a freshman. I bought my first DSLR camera and was completely self-taught with it. I realized that if I wanted good images of products, I couldn't rely on the internet to go find those images because you get all those shutterstock things all over your images, and I didn't want that. So a lot of times I take all my own photography. I learned studio photography so I could shoot all my product projects um, and have really good archives of all those, those photos. Well, it just kind of built from there, and I didn't do anything with it during school, but I always had a camera with me. Um, and then after school, I started getting more serious about it, and um, then I, I said, okay, it's time to start uh, really bringing on you know, clients and start taking photos professionally. Um, and uh, everything that I've learned as a designer, uh, and even in packaging, helped me build my business. And it started with building a website and building a brand. Um, and so here's a couple examples of a few of my, you know, my gallery page, and I've got a little bit about my creative process. Um, sounds funny to have a creative process in photography, but the reality is, is that you do. Um, as, a, as a photographer, you capture that story, and then me as the designer, um, I tell that story through the way that I lay those images out in a photo book or even in the order that I put them on an online gallery. And so um, my design background has helped me grow substantially in the photography world. So here's just a quick example of some of the stuff I've done. Um, I, I do weddings and I do kids and I do babies and um, it's just a, it's a boatload of fun. And I gotta say the, the absolute most fun to take photos of is like little one-year-old, two-year-old kids because they just have this innocent emotion uh, behind it and it's just so easy to, to capture. And then some of the product photography that I've done, uh, actually more recently through a customer I picked up through packaging and display. They said um, one of the customers was in my office. He overheard me talking about you know, shooting a wedding. He said, oh, you're you know, a photographer? And I said, yeah, I do that and I do some product photography. And one thing leads to another. He says, okay, drops off a bunch of bottles at my desk and says, you're hired. I need you to shoot you know, all this bottle photography and it's gonna be used on all these displays that you're running here in the future. Great, let's do it. And so um, fortunate enough to have a, a space uh, dedicated to studio photography at home and uh, knock out images for that customer. And lastly, I'm gonna leave you with a few closing remarks. Um, and I hope that didn't drag on too long here, but I think I read about time I wanted to be. Um, the first thing is always challenge yourself. Uh, try to get better at whatever you're doing. And uh, that's not to say that you need to limit yourself on the, on the uh, project that you're working on at the time, um, but learn from whatever you're doing. And like I said, finish your projects, turn them in and learn from it, but keep challenging yourself to learn new things, pick up new skills, learn that new piece of the software, whatever it might, might be. Um, I say this to my designers all the time and they say it back to me, but uh, learn something new every day. It sounds silly, but the reality is, is that lately I feel like I learn something new every day being in the business that I'm in and my designers feel the same way because we challenge each other, we have different skill sets and uh, you know we're constantly asking each other questions and uh, pushing each other to do new things and better things. So learn something new. Um, one I really like to stress is become a subject matter, matter expert. That's a really hard one to say. Don't say that 10 times fast. Um, being an expert in your subject matter uh, 
can open a lot of doors and it can make you a more successful person. I know, um, it's not about being a know-it-all about something, but take something and learn it really, really well. Uh, that's what I mean uh, by that. And then help others explore that as well. Um, I stressed it earlier, I'll stress it again, manage your time. Um, I want my designers that I work with to constantly manage their time because timelines are super tight in packaging display and we need to make sure that we're hitting those timelines because as design I never want to be a hindrance to the business. So time management, very, very key. And lastly, love what you do. Be passionate about it. I hope that I've shown some passion about what I do today uh, as far as packaging display. And, um, I challenge you guys to love what you do. Find what you're passionate about and go after it. Uh, you know, I'm passionate about the photography and, uh, and I went after it. And I, I want to mention in this too that all of my transition slides and everything that you saw that had a big photographic background is all stuff that I have taken in the past. And so when you are putting a presentation together and you do have a library of images, it helps where I didn't have to go to Google for anything in this uh, presentation. So. With that, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it, and I I'm, I'm hope this was informative uh, and educational. Um, and I guess with that, let me open it up to any questions that anybody might have. That's an excellent question. Um, I would say that it's split. So uh, currently, um, it, it's really uh, customer dependent as well. Um, a lot of uh, companies have internal marketing teams that they'll use and internal creative teams. Um, some of the bigger ones will actually have external uh, creative agencies that will dictate a lot of the graphics. Uh, and then um, some will come directly to us to assist with that creative. So I think it's a pretty even split as far as who we use or what the, who, what the customer is using to create the uh, graphic programs or uh, the kind of entire marketing campaigns. Does that? Yeah. So it's like a collaborative thing. Absolutely. Yeah, we're definitely always working together. A lot of times um, at the onset, we'll do uh, what we call FPO art uh, just to get the idea across because people want to see something in color. And then we'll create the structure in those die lines that I talked about. We'll then send those die lines out to a marketing agency or the customer internally, and they'll go ahead and create the graphics for it and send it back to us, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, no, I completely understand your question. I think it's, I think it's a great question. Um, we absolutely have felt the, <laughs> the Amazon fist, <laughs> if you will. Um, even Walmart is going online for a lot of their sales. And, you know, the biggest consumer of displays uh, and packaging and retail is somebody like a Walmart. Um, and so we absolutely have felt that, uh, that kind of hit. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it pain. It's, it's not as drastic as you might think. Um, grocery is still going really, really strong with display. Um, and packaging has evolved. It's changed into what's important. So what, what may have been emphasis put on graphics and grabbing attention has now been put on uh, safety of the product getting to the home. Um, and so we may not be focusing as much on the graphics, but we may be focusing more on that internal structure to support and protect the package for shipping, which may not have happened before because in the case of ship, uh, sending boxes into a retailer, you're taking those and you're putting them in a big master cart and you're palletizing them and damage is not as big of a deal. But when you're sending an individual one in an Amazon box that gets one piece of a bubble and it just shakes around and gets thrown around, you have to protect that package even more. And so I think on the packaging side, you see a little bit of transition on the display side. I wouldn't say that, that we've seen a huge impact. I know I mentioned it, um, and it is something that we're considerate about and that we've recognized, uh, but that's something that we work directly with a lot of the marketing teams and marketing agencies to help bring new programs. Um, and, and the two that I mentioned, the bottle carrier and the 7-Up uh, display, those didn't have any product in them. 
they were call to action pieces and you're seeing more and more of that where you'll get these big toppers of information you know basically information um, centers uh, as a display instead of necessarily a product vehicle absolutely <laughs> more so than you might imagine um, I can think of a, a customer um, physician's formula I I did it's it, cosmetics and I'm not passionate about cosmetics. I don't know much about background, but we were asked to develop, at one point it was like 15 different concepts for different products and each one of those needed three different ideas behind it. And that may have been one of the most complicated or, or struggling design projects that we've had. Because you're right, if you're not passionate about the product or don't know anything about the brand, it is very, very difficult you definitely get designer writer's block uh, a little bit. And what you do then is you go back to your archives and you try to grab inspiration from what you've done previously or potentially what, what I like to do is I like to go to the web and I like to look at the brand and I like to look at the website and I try to look at the product and see if there's visual cues or some sort of style or... Uh, cut out or pop out or logo piece or something that has uh, some defining um, piece of the, the puzzle and, and kind of focus on that and then integrate that into the design. And so you just kind of, you kind of work with it, but that's a great question. And it, it's a really, really challenging part of the business um, because we work with so many different brands. That was actually um, uh, a character from one of the Hangover movies, uh, and it was uh, Todd, it's Todd Phillips, the director. Uh, it was his um, cameo role in the first Hangover movie. <laughs> so we just took that character and built the bot behind it. No idea why, but it was, seemed like a good idea at the time, <laughs> and, and seems like a funny character. Previously, we had, uh, well, every corrugated and manufacturing or corrugated and point of purchase companies got their own sales folks. They have purchasing people. They've got a design staff. They have manufacturing. Um, I am a lot more integrated into all of those roles in my current position. Um, I've got a few accounts that I help sell directly, um, and I'm really the face of the business. Um, and so I'm constantly bringing in new projects with them and discussing projects ahead of time. I would say that as a designer, um, it is key to be uh, integrated with those roles and kind of have cross-platform knowledge. Um, and so uh, spend some time out in the plant understanding how things are manufactured. Spend some time out on the road with your, with your sales team and be in front of customers. I think that's honestly helped me more than anything, um, especially in the speaking uh, standpoint. Um, I remember my elevator pitch. <laughs> uh, if you guys have done those yet um, or seen them or been a part of them, but I failed miserably at it. It was terrible. It was, uh, it was a really, really scary time. It was intimidating. Um, I, I flubbed the whole thing. And what that told me was get out there and learn how to public speak and be in front of people and learn how to sell yourself. And so being on the road with some of my account managers in my position at IP, I was out on the road a lot in front of customers. And when you get to sell something that you're passionate about and something that you've worked on directly, it's a lot easier to talk about it. And I think that's where um, I learned the most was being out on the road as a part of the sales team um, and selling ideas and concepts. That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I would say it's a blend of the two. Uh, and in this case, it was never intended to be sold. Uh, it was literally intended to be a promotional piece. Um, and uh, being the product designer that my training is in, um, blend, being able to blend those two together and create something like that was just a really cool um, experience. But I would just call it a promotional piece. It, it's a marketing piece. 
Um, and so, yeah, could they have wanted to order a bunch of them? Absolutely. And then it would have been, you know, I'm not sure if we would have called it a product or a display or a, a pack, you know, packaging or whatever, but um, I, that's, a, that's a great question. I didn't think about it like that. That's good. Um, not as much as I'd like to, and I try to bring um, our research mentality from ID into the display world because I think it's lacking a little bit. So I try to bring um, a level of that, uh, a little bit more in-depth research, but typically research is uh, <laughs> half hour to an hour on the web looking at uh, that customer's website, their products, understanding what they are about. Um, a lot of times you can gain a lot by the about us uh, of a company um, and then looking at what colors they use and their lifestyle imagery. And then after that, I try to go and look at competitors um, as well. Um, and so it may not be as much about looking at the kind of the digital world for inspiration, but a lot of times it comes down to going out into the real world. Uh, going to, we do a ton of what we call store checks. And I think that's where a lot of the research happens. We're constantly taking photos on our phones and sharing them with our fellow designers about what's new in the market and, and who's doing what and what displays is working well and which one's not and uh, techniques of builds and that kind of thing. So in this industry, research and understanding customer um, insights is becoming a bigger deal. Uh, and I, I hope to kind of keep expanding on that. So fortunately in our industry, corrugated is 100% recyclable. And uh, we like to stress that to our customers because a lot of times, I, I mentioned earlier that um, we talk about uh, temporary, semi-permanent, and permanent displays. And a lot of, basically they're all doing the same thing, but they're built out of different materials. And the, the temporary is really that paper uh, product, which is completely recyclable. I have a quick story about that. I had a, a, a customer a while back that had a display program that they, they wanted. It needed to be a semi-permanent display. They wanted it on wheels and it needed to last in retail for six months. So we needed to develop a corrugated solution that did so because they wanted the entire thing recyclable. And I mention it because we had to even get down to researching what casters were available that were built out of completely recyclable materials. And so it is a big deal in this business and a lot of customers are stressing um, recyclable materials. We often put the big recycled logo um, and integrate it into graphics so that uh, the end user knows that it can be recycled uh, because we do use some different coatings and that kind of thing that may not, that almost kind of seem like plastic, but they're not. They're completely um, paper and recyclable materials. Um, and then the other, the other part of it is um, the actual virgin material. And so the actual paper that goes into building the corrugated, that has increased in the amount of recycled content versus the amount of virgin pulp paper. And so um, we're using less trees to create the same amount of paper. Uh, 50, 50, it, it is absolutely both. Sometimes we go into designing a, a display and it is a one-time deal and that's how we design it. We're not even thinking modular and those can bite us in the butt a little bit. <laughs> so we always try to think about that modularity aspect, at least we ask the question, do you think you may use this for another purpose in the future? If you do, maybe we make a few different design decisions about it. And other times we're getting project and this needs to be a modular solution. We need to use it for you know, these 10 different products. So design it around all of those and we're gonna keep using it for all these different uh, products. So I had a little bit of a family background in packaging and display. And so I was very familiar with the concept of it. Um, the position at first was an internship and I like to call it the longest running internship ever because I think my internship lasted for a little over five years. Uh, <laughs> now it wasn't, I wasn't treated as an intern. I became a full fledged uh, design 
full-time design role, uh, but with uh, flexible part-time hours because I was going to school. And they were awesome about letting me tailor my schedule around my class schedule. And so it definitely started as an intern. As an intern, I mean, I was literally sweeping the floors and cutting samples and, and building stuff, um, but quickly kind of showed my desire to keep moving forward. And I think, um, yeah, career-wise, no, it was not on the, definitely was not on the agenda. <laughs> uh, I was not looking that way. Uh, but I soon kind of realized what a interesting field it was and, and uh, worked out really well from there. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> Um, I wish I had more experience going through that struggle. Um, and I say that because I was fortunate enough to have a position waiting for me when I graduated, uh, just because of how things worked out. Um, but the reason I, I was asked here today was talk about this idea of an alternate path. And, um, I hope what that did is kind of, uh, open people's eyes into saying, you, you may not just be looking at, you know, industrial designer jobs, right? Or it may not just be a marketing job. Um, my advice is to connect with as many people as possible. Um, get your work out there. Um, sh share. Um, and uh, when you're looking for positions um, and even interviewing, um, be passionate about what you're doing and show your show your vast skill set, if you will. Um, it's not so much about maybe individual uh, products or individual design projects, but it's more about how you connect the dots of all of your skill set. Uh, drive. Yeah, I'm going to leave it at that simple. Um, be willing to take chances and show that you can work your ass off. <laughs> um, it's not so much about you know working you to death, right? I definitely don't mean that, but um, show that you are passionate about what you're doing um, and show that you have some drive to succeed. Absolutely, on so many different levels. Um, and so I actually didn't put it, I'm actually surprised I didn't put a part of this presentation, but it's actually kind of boring to look at, but they're really, really involved, is with every display project we do what we call um, in-plant instructions. And so that's how to actually build these things uh, before they're shipped out to retail. And then we do instructions on how to actually set these things up in retail. Uh, along with that, we spend a lot of time going out into the plant or to what we call a pack out facility to facilitate building uh, displays. And so we'll be right there in with them showing how to build these things uh, because a lot of times it can be really complicated to build. Uh, we try to make it as simple as possible because every touch that you make is, is dollars um, that the customer is spending to build these things. So we try to make it simple, uh, but we're right there. Um, a perfect example of, of uh, end user um, support is we created a corrugated cooler for Red Bull and it was shipped out to convenience stores. And so corrugated cooler, you're like, how does that work? Well, basically it was a big plastic bin that sat in a corrugated display uh, that had a bunch of supports and it had a drain valve and all kinds of good stuff. And we sourced all these parts from Asia and we had vinyl lamb on this thing, but the reality was is that stores were getting it and they were leaving the valve open. And so they didn't notice a problem right away, but as soon as the ice started melting, we got water on the floor and our displays started to melt. <laughs> and so we provided in-store support of creating new parts and shipping them out and actually going to a bunch of these stores and fixing um, a lot of these parts. So it does happen. We absolutely work with both the customers and the retailers directly to um, assist and then also fix any potential problems that arise. And then did that impact their ROI on top of that? Or? It didn't impact theirs. <laughs> it impacted ours <laughs> quite a bit. Um, 
and I uh, don't think we ran that project uh, ever again. But uh, what it did show was proof of concept, and it actually led to some other business for it. So um, it, it didn't tarnish the business. Um, it, it put a strain on it for sure, uh, but we everyone grew from it because the concept was actually developed from Red Bull, and they brought it to us of what they wanted to accomplish. And so we got it done for them, but there were some things that uh, I think both parties missed with it. It was a great growing experience. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Thank you, everybody, again, for uh, having me.